uh, with the collaboration also of the uh, Ministry uh, of uh, Fisheries of the Maldives. But, uh, uh, and something obviously is missing in Milan. And so the 8th of June will be the World Ocean Day. Uh, and uh, so we thought to have a post conference in Venice that will start uh, on the 8th with the collaboration of the University of Kafoskari from Venice and of Ocean Space TBA 21, so to also put in evidence the artistical value of the ocean. Um, I have many people to thank for this event, um, starting obviously from the rectorate and the department, um, the uh, IGU and the department uh, of and our department have also been sponsor of this uh, uh, conference. Uh, I thank the keynote speakers who have been uh, uh, so nice to accept uh, the invitation to this uh, uh, event. Uh, unfortunately, for a family reason, two and um, three of our keynote speakers, and also for health reason, couldn't be here. One is David Abulafia, another is Kimberly Peters, uh, and then Roberto Casati, who is now ill, but will participate uh, online tomorrow. He, uh, so this is very recent, and at last minute also, he couldn't come. Um, I must thank you also, all the organizing committee, especially Valentina Anzoise, who has been the coordinator of this work, Professor Stefano Malatesta, who is fundamental for the whole organization of the event, and then uh, Massimiliano Fanto, Beatrice Ruggeri, and Alice Salimbeni, who has been working very hard in those days. Uh, they are totally <laughs> dedicating the whole time, for the last months, I will say, just to this conference. And this whole staff, Pietro Agnoletto, Stefania Benetti, Cristina Canella, um, Claudio Melli, and Erika Neri, all has been very, very helpful. Uh, just some practical issues uh, for uh, the logistic of this event. Uh, you receive a venue map, I suppose, and you can also see the program online, uh, everywhere. Um, in the, each room, there will be a staff member that you can recognize because he is staff, uh, and he will be helping you in anything you need. Um, there are no organized meal, but there are several bars and cafe all around. Um, I will now um, give the word. Uh, unfortunately, the rector of our university. Giovanna Ian Antoni uh, is stuck in the traffic and didn't manage to come. We have here the director of our department, uh, Cristina Palmieri, and I give her the word for some Thank you. institutional greetings. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you, Marcella, and uh, good morning, uh, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Uh, my task uh, is to welcome you on behalf of our department, that, that is the Department of Human Sciences for Education, Riccardo Massa. But uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me give a particular thank to all the organizers uh, uh, this conference, uh, and so Stefano Malatesta, uh, and so Marcella, and so all the scientific and the local organizing committee, and all the people that are, that are involved in organizing this conference. Uh, I don't want to, uh, to take up too much of your time because I know that uh, you have uh, a very busy program today, 
but uh, uh, let me say that we are honored as university and as department to host this conference because uh, uh, of the topics uh, uh, that are addressed uh, that are addressed in this conference uh, that are at the heart of the public uh, the current public debate and we know um, how it's important nowadays uh, to contribute to this debate uh, from a scientific point of view. I'm referring in particular to uh, those two points. Uh, as uh, Marcella said, we are in the middle of uh, the UNESCO Ocean <laughs> Decade and the themes of sustainability, uh, cultural heritage, uh, and uh, education related to the sea uh, are at the heart of the decade. Uh, and so, actually, uh, this conference can give an essential contribute uh, about this. But uh, uh, a second point is uh, the importance of the concept of uh, uh, ocean literacy. Uh, which is based on awareness uh, and does education uh, and the, of the complex uh, links uh, uh, between ocean spaces and society. But there's another reason uh, why we are pleased to be here today and uh, it is related with the mission of our department. Um, our mission is to involve uh, human sciences, so anthropology, psychology, philosophy, uh, history and of course geography and the pedagogy, I'm a pedagogist, and um, in studying education in all its forms. Um, we, um, that is to say that education uh, is made not only at schools, uh, but uh, it happens in all the different uh, environments, in all the different environments uh, of our life. So, coast, seas, <laughs> mountains, rural environments, uh, cities, suburbs, uh, uh, streets, uh, and so on. And in particular, uh, we have a particular line of research uh, in our department that, that is related in, uh, that is interesting in studying uh, um, how the environment itself uh, produces education, uh, having a huge impact uh, uh, in the life, uh, in the ways of life uh, of human and non-human beings. So this is the reason why uh, we think that this conference uh, is a very interesting uh, opportunity for us and also uh, I think that maybe our department can give uh, a good contribute to this conference. But I stopped, I spoke too much and uh, I wish you good work and uh, enjoy your conference. Thank you, Christina. I have to go because I have the exam in another building, and so I'm very sorry. <laughs> but thank you again. So, our next speaker is the president of the IGU, uh, Michael Medios. Uh, Michael couldn't come to Milan. He is in China, but actually he's in England, I think. Yes. Uh, <laughs> He's a very busy man and always traveling around. And uh, please, I give you the word. Uh, thank you, uh, Marcella. Uh, buongiorno. Uh, good morning. Uh, you're correct. I should have been in China um, speaking to you, which is why I couldn't come to Milan. But actually, uh, I'm in London uh, because last night the... Royal Geographical Society presented the International Geographical Union with a special gold medal for our services to geography uh, over 100 years. Uh, this is a medal that's very rarely awarded and uh, we're very privileged, absolutely delighted uh, to have been recognized in this way by one of the oldest and most prestigious geography uh, societies uh, in the world. So I, I do, in fact, join you from Europe, if not at least uh, from Milan and, and Italy. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to meet you all at least this morning, albeit online. Um, the reason why I think the RGS uh, awarded uh, us the gold medal is because of the work that we do through the commissions. 
and the current conference is a manifestation of the work of, uh, in particular, the history of, of Geographical Thought Commission, uh, but also the five others that have joined together to uh, recognize the importance of the oceans and the seas in geographical thought. We have more than 40 commissions. Um, interestingly, despite the fact that the oceans cover some two thirds of the planet, we don't have any that uh, specifically deal with them. We have a coastal commission. I suppose that might be the closest, but we have many that have uh, an interest, at least, uh, if not a, a direct focus on this important topic. And, and this is particularly relevant, of course, uh, in, as you pointed out, Chair, the uh, United Nations a decade of the ocean, uh, or at least the ocean science for sustainable development. And the attempt, uh, I think very important one, to try and reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health that I think we're all uh, aware of. Um, geographers must and indeed do play, I think, an important role in trying to improve conditions uh, for sustainable or at least towards sustainable development um, in the oceans. But as the topics in this conference uh, suggest, it's not only about sustainable development. There are many different approaches to considering the ocean and the seas and the topics that you're going to be discussing over the next few days. I think are very much a, a reflection um, of that. Um, of course, I would like to thank the, the local organizers, particularly Marcella, who's uh, driven this process and mentioned the names of all of those you, of you in Milan who've been helping to get this together. Um, I particularly liked the innovation and the willingness to be flexible and to engage, uh, as you have done, with our other uh, at least the one that has taken place so far this year, we have at least one more to go, thematic conference that took place in Osaka in Japan um, in April. I think that innovation, uh, if you like, the, the, the opportunity to be something of a hybrid is an innovation that I think the IGU should embrace uh, going forward. And I think it's a lesson perhaps for, for other commissions. But congratulations to you. I know how much hard work goes in to organizing events um, of this sort. And I'm sure uh, it will be a great success for all of the, you, you who are involved uh, either directly in person in Milan or those of you like me who are joining uh, in an online format. Thank you very much for that hard work and for keeping the IGU machine well oiled and moving in the right direction so that uh, we at, at least I think can um, give the Royal Geographical Society at least good reason for them having awarded us the uh, special gold medal last night. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. It's really a pity that you are not with us and have a, a very good journey when you go back to China. Yes, today. S so now we had the vice president of the IGU, Maria Paradiso, from the University of Naples. Please. Thank you, Marcella. <clears throat> Marcella, Stefano, uh, Enrico, Valentina, and all Elena, and all colleagues from Bicocca University, I would like to express you much appreciation for your finest work in networking with other uh, IGU commissions, because I think this is really relevant. And I would like also to express uh, much recognition to the Commission of the History of Geographical Thought for this finest work in uh, building up uh, this kind of conference. I believe, as you said, Marcella, that is a really intellectual, challenging, and intriguing work that uh, we expect from this conference. And I would like just to add this view. It, it's my view. Probably you share on this with me. I think uh, this, uh, the, front, the marine frontiers and all in this conference you organize in this way evokes as not only a critical approach, a reflexive understanding, and the disciplinary uh, um, collegial work, but in my view, this kind of conference and also the topic uh, evokes as probably, but this is my view again, a more engaged science in understanding how our world is globally increasing inequalities and how our way 
of procedure on science can be more, you know, understanding about more marginalized groups on the heart and how we can contribute to an overall process of a more informed scientific thoughts and also um, probably some additional thoughts to um, for actions to a, to a better world where uh, we live. So I would like to express again uh, much appreciation. Uh, and uh, of course, I would like to wish a great success, but I'm fully confident that it, is, it will be great, plenty beautiful moments for us from a scientific point of view, also from fr friendship point of view in uh, your beautiful organized conference. So Marcella and all colleagues, again, much success and uh, thank you for your great engagement. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> so our next speaker is the colleague Elena Dell'Agnese from the University of Milano Bicocca, who is president of the Association of Italian Geographers. Thank you, I was just wondering why I was being invited to be uh, a speaker in this uh, opening session because I'm no more the vice president of the IGU. I'm no more the chair of the Commission on Political Geography. I'm not in the right department because I belong to a different department and in a different building. And so, yes, but maybe because I'm the president of the Italian geographer, so I'm as a, the voice of Italian geographer, welcome to Italy and to our community. And uh, since uh, uh, Marcella was saying at the beginning that uh, maybe uh, we, are, we are just wondering why we are here, we don't have the sea. We used to have, and maybe we are going to have in the future. So in order to avoid to have the sea in Milano, maybe we should work in very hard on the topic of climate change and things like that. So I think that this kind of conference can be very helpful also in, a, in order to avoid, I like the sea, but not in Milano, please. <laughs> and uh, since I know that one of the, only the press the only quality you can have when you are giving institutional addressing of the people is just being quick. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> you never know, maybe we will have beautiful beaches in Milan. <laughs> <I mean>, so. <laughs> <laughs> Better know. Okay. Our next speaker is Professor uh, Takashi Yamazaki from the University of Osaka. Uh, and he was also uh, the chair of a very successful conference that has been uh, held in uh, Osaka this April, 4th four, four to 6th of April, uh, and who has been also connected to this conference. Uh, the title of the conference was Framing Islands and the Ocean, uh, uh, Conflicts, sorry, Conflict, Sustainability uh, and Peace, and it was dedicated to Ireland. So Ireland and the oceans are the two themes very connected. And we also organized together a webinar on May 19th, so maybe somebody of you participated to it, that and the title was Framing Islands and the Ocean, Osaka and Milan Perspective. And Professor Takachi has been one of the great uh, organizer of this event. So I give the word to uh, Professor Yamazaki because he will now briefly introduce what has been happening in Osaka. We are also very grateful to him because he gave also, also uh, sustain on the organization of the conference, many ideas, how to do it. He showed us how hard it is to organize a conference. <laughs> so thank you again, please. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, as the chief organizer, of the IGU thematic conference on islands in relations, as uh, Marcella uh, introduced, uh, held in Osaka, Japan last April. I congratulate Marcella and the Milan organizing team uh, on the successful opening of the conference and thank them for inviting me to this opening session. These two IGU conferences were first planned as separate events, but finally proposed to the IGU as interrelated and collaborating meetings. We have been working together for the past year uh, to promote a holistic understanding of islands and the ocean seas as inseparable geographical entities and concepts. We also organized, as, as, as Marisha said, an inter-conference uh, online workshop 
titled Framing Islands and Ocean Osaka Median Perspectives last month to bridge between central perspectives of the two uh, conferences. The, uh, this uh, complementary aspects uh, 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 between the two conferences are not limited to their central concepts or perspectives. The venues of the two conferences are located in different parts of the world. One is in the east, and the other is in the west here. So this locational aspect, or the geography of the conferences, was very important for the Osaka conference. I will explain, uh, I will explain why. <laughs> the subtitle of the Osaka conference was, as Marjira introduced, <coughs> Conflicts, Sustainability, and Peace, meaning that the conference situated islands in three relational dimensions. One, conflictual power relations. Two, economic and ecological sustainability. And three, eventual island peace as a policy goal. The original idea of such relational composition of the conference themes came from the International Joint Research Project where I am a principal investigator. The project title is The Construction of Transborder Geopolitics in the East China Sea Region. It started in 2018 and will end in March 2024 after one year extension. This joint research project was an academic reaction to growing geopolitical or interstate tensions and the militarization of islands in the East China Sea region. The project attempted to explore the significance of transborder, trans-island interactions within the region to problematize and hopefully deconstruct classical, state-centric geopolitics. As co-investigators for the project, I selected the leading political geographers in Taiwan, South Korea, and China, and young Japanese scholars. Although individual investigators' scopes might be limited, I thought that this limitation could be overcome if they were properly joined. The project went well for the past year, and I was able to organize the International Geography Conference featuring East Asian borderland in December uh, 2019. Then the pandemic came. So to make a long story short, the Osaka conference held last April was something like the last cry of the project that was not fully developed. However, the conference attracted 86 in person and 35 virtual participants from 28 countries and regions. The biggest participant group was, of course, Japan, 28. The second was the US, 24. Seven of whom were from Hawaii and Guam. The third was Taiwan, 13, followed by China and Switzerland, I don't know why, <laughs> five for each. <laughs> no one from Russia. These statistics may show geographical proximity between the venue and the participants' origins, but the presented papers suggested possible common research field we could share, such as the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and the Pacific Ocean. An advantage of holding an IGU thematic conference in a particular part of the world may be that participants can have a double theme and regional focus. If such conferences are held on similar subjects in different parts of the world, then participants will be able to have more comprehensive perspectives on the subjects. A virtual or hybrid conference format makes it possible. This is what our two conferences have been trying to do for the past three months. In other words, compared to the Osaka Conference on Islands, this Miran conference will provide participants with new maritime perspectives and different geographical contexts of Europe and the Mediterranean Sea, for example. 
Since joining IGU activities in the early 2010s, I have attended many independent IGU conferences and pre-post conferences. However, I've never seen such a collaborative and interrelated endeavor in IGU conferences. After the Osaka conference, I circulated the call for contributions to the proposed publication project among the participants. Currently, 27 participants, including many early career scholars, will plan to submit their papers. This number will be enough to organize one journal special issue and one themed book. In this sense, the Osaka conference was successful, and I hope the same for the Milan conference in broadening our scope and deepening our understanding of the ocean and seas. I look forward to stimulating and insightful papers and active, engaging, constructive discussions for the coming four, four days. So thank you very much, uh, again, very much for having me here today. Grazie mille. Domo arigato gozaimashita. Thank you, Takashi, for your words. It's really have been a, a, a great work together. Uh, and now uh, we uh, can uh, go on with the uh, program and uh, have our first keynote uh, lecture. Um, the speaker is a uh, uh, Professor Philip Steinberg. He is a U Arctic Chair in Political Geography at the University of Durham. Please, Philip, come here. He, he leads also the Durham Arctic Research Center for training and interdisciplinary collaboration and the IBRU, Internationally Boundary Research Unit. I think that everybody who works on the seat knows Philip Steinberg. He had published widely on ocean and island. He was also keynote speaker at the Osaka conference. Oh, he has been traveling a lot. <laughs> and uh, he works on a political construction of territory beyond the limits of land. So this is really the key issues also of his work. Please, Philip. Yeah. Um, can we switch the screen? I need to do something. No. Just some. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to Marcella, to all the organizers for putting this together. Um, it's really an honor being here and opening up the conference and pairing it with Osaka it has worked out beautifully for me probably means too much flying, but otherwise it's, it's really been a wonderful thing. Um, I also want to thank uh, really a huge number of collaborators. There we go. Uh, a huge number of collaborators. What I'll be presenting today will be an original piece of work, but it builds off of work that I've been doing over decades, I guess, with a, a range of collaborators on ongoing projects, new ones and the like. And in fact, one of the real pleasures of my job is that I just get to work with some incredible people on incredible things. So this is also sort of a way of saying thanks there. Um, okay, what I'm going to do today is start off by kind of trying to unpack what I might call four myths of critical ocean geography. Things that we hear all the time that we accept and that maybe we actually need to think a bit more about or at least think about why we accept these myths as, I, think, I mean, myths might be a bit too strong, but why we accept these truisms without really, without question. And um, first of all, one that actually we already heard from Michael Meadows, is that our planet is 70% ocean. Uh, actually, it's 0.12% ocean, which then leads to the question, how do you get from 70% to 0.12%? It's not that either of these numbers is wrong per se, 70% uh, is the planet's surface, so 70% of the planet's surface is covered by ocean. 0.12% uh, is when you go into volume. So if you actually look at the 
volume of planet Earth and you know, dig out all the magma and mantle and all that stuff, um, and then scoop out what's in the ocean, you end up with about 0.12% ocean. And it's not that you know, either, and of course you could take this measure in other directions as well. You could go to the atmosphere and then look at how much water is in the hydrologic cycle and all number of ways that you can get different numbers of how much ocean there is in, in the world. Uh, but one would think that actually if you're thinking about the ocean, starting with volume and depth uh, might be a very important place to start. So at least we need to think about why we automatically use this 70% figure and not the 0.12% figure. Although, of course, it does make us more important as ocean geographers, so maybe that, that's a good reason in itself. Um, second myth, 90% uh, of trade is carried by ocean vessels. We hear this all the time. 90% of everything travels by sea. Uh, I've been working with uh, Christian de Bucalar at uh, University of Melbourne on this for a while, and we kind of think it's actually more like about 10%. Again, how do you get from 90% to 10%? Well, this graph kind of says it all, that the 90% measure is the orange over the blue lines, uh, what percentage of imports, uh, or in effect international trade, is maritime trade. Uh, but of course, there's uh, an awful lot of, uh, of the economy that doesn't result in international trade. Uh, even now, there's a lot of local production in the economy of goods and services, although this is just goods, not services. And um, that's an important point empirically, but I think it also speaks to a broader recognition that's been made by a, a host of geographers, uh, Doreen Massey would be one example, but you could certainly name lots, that even as we live in a global world, the local still matters, place still matters, household production, even individual economies matter. Um, I think also, in particular, when you look at the ocean, it's easy to fall into sort of a variant of, of John Agnew's territorial trap where we separate kind of the international economy from what goes on domestically. And this is a reminder that even when we speak about a global space like the ocean, we need to avoid falling into that. Um, third one is the kind of statement that the ocean is not empty. Now, I mean, I see why we say this. I say it all the time. It's a, it's a necessary corrective to the idea that the ocean is this empty space that we just go across. At the same time, highlighting the idea of the ocean is full, so that full and empty become kind of binaries, are themselves, that itself, I think, is a bit problematic. Um, to give an example, as I mentioned, I fly a lot too much and um, often look down from airplane windows at the ocean below, which is a real treat for me, right? I'm an ocean geographer, this is, this is cool, this is great, I get to look at the ocean. But after a little bit, I get kind of bored. You know, I don't quite know what to look at. There's not a foreground, there's no objects to settle your focus on, and yet it's still very much full of meaning. So there's meaning in a kind of absence. Um, there, there's a, a sort of the sublime, this idea that vastness itself uh, constructs something, which means that knowledge is not just knowledge of specific spaces and times and discrete material objects. Knowledge is something broader than that. And this is also, I think, a theme that's coming out in some of the work on the abyss that is being brought into geography by, by a number of people, mostly from uh, Caribbean thought, uh, which again, is this idea of there being a substance in emptiness. And it actually speaks to a broader literature on how materiality is not just about objects, but about forces, affect, processes, relations, encounters, and assemblages. And then the fourth uh, myth that I want to uh, work with is the one that the ocean is unexplored. Uh, often the statement here is we know more about outer space, the moon, uh, Mars, pick your celestial body, uh, than we do about the ocean or more often the deep sea. And there's some truth to this. I mean, the ocean is not mapped at the same resolution as the celestial bodies. And yet at the same time, first of all, empirically, you've got things like the David Sandwell map from 2014, which is, okay, it's at five kilometer resolution, which is not as good as the maps of the celestial bodies, but it's still like not a bad map. Um, and of course now with GEMCO uh, mapping project is the idea that by 2030, we actually should have the entire seafloor mapped at a 100 meter resolution, which is about the same as celestial bodies. But I think more to the point, this very kind of notion of 
the ocean is unexplored or the ocean is unknown points to a kind of singular idea of what knowledge is and what exploration is. And in the, the effort to decolonize ideas of knowledge, to decolonize disciplines, a lot of that is saying, you know, maybe knowledge is not simply one way of knowing. Knowledge involves multiple ways of knowing. Think of, for instance, John Child's work on uh, Papuan attitudes toward the seabed. It's, it's knowledge of the seabed, but a very different kind of knowledge uh, to, to put front. So what do we learn from digging into these myths? Um, first of all, it's not that any of these myths are necessarily wrong. And I don't want people to go edit their papers that you're presenting later today and tomorrow and take out that reference to 70% ocean or, or whatever. It's not wrong, okay? Um, I think what's more interesting is that by paying attention to these myths and paying attention to why we take them for granted, we can start thinking about how we think about the ocean and how we think with the ocean, because I think that's a lot of what we're trying to do here, how those thoughts are constrained by an underpitch, underpinning spatial ontology, in particular a spatial ontology that comes from land, uh, one that sees our world as one of surfaces, points, boundaries, and areas. Not necessarily the only way to see the world, and maybe not the best if you're starting from the ocean. Um, that sees the world as one where the global kind of subsumes the, the local in a hierarchical ordering of scale that it incorporates a world where space is understood as filled with positive determinate objects that are fixed in space and time. Again, a very landed and not oceanic way of seeing. And that understands there being a clear divide between knowledge, singular objective truths, and on the other hand, ignorance. And I think we can do better as thinking about the ocean, and even more so thinking with the ocean, requires us perhaps not to overturn these assumptions, but at least to work critically, uh, to think critically about why these assumptions are so easily accepted. And that's really what I want to do here. Now, I also want to note that each of these ontologies involves drawing lines, lines that bind and define objects, lines that draw distinctions between the global and the local, lines that distinguish foreground, matter, from background, environment, and lines that distinguish truths from stories. And that, in turn, takes me to the title of this talk, Upon a Painted Ocean. Uh, some of you might have noted the title, that it comes from the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Um, and uh, first of all, a bit of context. In, in the poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, these stanzas appear after uh, the ship has gone down to Antarctica, and the mariner has killed the albatross, and now it's floated northwards, and the ship is stuck in the doldrums under the hot sun with no wind, and everybody's dying around the mariner, and he says these lines. But what I really want to draw attention to is this line, this idea of a painted ship upon a painted ocean. And I think Coleridge, the author from The Ancient Mariner, means two things here. I mean, one is that the ocean is artificially stilled, right? Nothing is moving. That's, and I think that's really the image that he's trying to get here with the idea of a painted ship on a painted ocean. There's no movement. Um, but also, this, the other thing about this line, a painted ocean, is that the artificial stilling is achieved through inscription. So that we, the landlubber reading the poem, or the wedding guest, in the case of The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, we know the ocean through painting it whether literally through a painting or through some other inscription, such as a poem or a legal system or a map, or perhaps in a more figurative kind of way. And that in turn takes me to um, a quote that I, I use a lot from Carl Schmidt on writing the ocean and writing on the ocean, where he writes that the sea has no character in the original sense of the word from the Greek meaning to engrave, to scratch, to imprint, on the waves, there is nothing but waves. And what Schmidt's doing here is he's drawing a contrast between the geopolitics of the ocean and the geopolitics of land, uh, saying that on land, you can, you can differentiate the surface, you can communicate ownership, improvement of the land, and that leads to a certain kind of politics. And on the ocean, where you can't do any of those things, you can't leave a mark, a different kind of politics results. So the ocean has a different politics from land because of its different distinct physicality. Now, 
Uh, Kimberly Peters and I, in a series of articles, have critiqued Schmidt's notion of inscription and what it means for oceanic thinking, and I'm not going to fully rehearse that argument here. But very briefly, on the one hand, we commend Schmidt for stressing that any discussion of the ocean and its politics must begin with consideration of its physicality. But on the other hand, we critique both his understanding of its physicality, that idea that the ocean consists of nothing but waves that are without character, um, and also his understanding of the politics that emerges from that view of ocean space. So all of this suggests that we need to pay more attention to the lines that are drawn on the sea, in maps, in paintings, in law, and ultimately on the sea itself, and also the lines that are drawn by the sea. Because only by uncovering the ways in which these lines mediate between the ocean and its representations, its scientific framings, and its policy prescriptions can we begin to challenge those ontological assumptions that we've seen underpinning the four myths. And so I want to develop that through a few examples. Uh, first of all, turning to the North Sea continental shelf cases of 1969. Uh, a bit of background for people who aren't Law of the Sea nerds like me. Um, in 1958, the first UN conference on the Law of the Sea was held. It led to four conventions, one of which was the Convention on the Continental Shelf, which among other things, or the main thing it did, was grant coastal states exclusive rights to the resources of their continental shelves. Uh, this all became a really big deal in the North Sea in the late 60s when oil and gas resources were discovered in the North Sea, at which point Germany looked at this map that resulted from the convention and said, wait, this isn't good. Um, in effect, because of the uh, shape of the coast and that the, the convex sort of curve of the Elba Delta, uh, Germany gets crowded out of the middle of the North Sea, which was particularly a problem for Germany, of course, West Germany at the time. Uh, it was particularly a problem for West Germany uh, because that's where the good oil and gas resources are. So to go a little further into this, I need to throw up a few quotations from that 1958 convention. Uh, first of all, Article I of the convention does, as Article I's often do, create definitions. Uh, so it defines the, the shelf, the seabed, as the sea, seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas adjacent to the coast, but outside the area of the territorial sea to a depth of 200 meters or beyond that limit to where the depth of the superjacent waters admits of the exploitation of the natural resources of the said areas. Aside from being absolutely horrible legal wording, uh, there's a couple ambiguities that are contained in this quote. Uh, first of all, there's adjacency. Adjacent is not really a clear word from a legal perspective. It, it means nearby, but what does nearby mean when you're talking precise law and lines? So it's interesting that they chose that word adjacency. Um, the other kind of ambiguity in here is that term natural resource. Uh, admits of the exploitation of the natural resources of the said area. Well, I mean, if you stretch things far enough, anything can be a natural resource that you can exploit. It might not be economically viable, but you can turn anything into a resource if you really want to. Um, and then for that matter, what happens if a space that is exploitable for resources then becomes not exploitable for resources or the other way around? For instance, in the North Sea, actually, turning from uh, oil platforms to wind turbines uh, then suddenly different spaces would become the shelf. Um, so those are, there are two issues, but maybe even more crucial looking at this quote is that you see that the shelf was not defined as a physical entity in the sense that the land of the state is defined as the essence of that state's territory. Uh, rather, it's simply the bottom of a used or usable space that happens to be adjacent to a state. As in Schmidt's formulation, or actually you could even go back to Croce's here, the physicality of the ocean is elided. The shelf is simply the usable space that's at the bottom of the empty, featureless ocean where there is, to quote Schmidt, nothing but waves. Um, I also want to draw out um, something from Article 6 of the convention. Uh, this is where this discussion of, of delimitation, when you have two states whose shelves are adjacent to each other. And it says that unless another boundary line is justified by special circumstances, the boundary shall be determined by application of the principle of equidistance, which is how you get to this map. Um, what I want to point out there is that term special circumstances. 
Uh, I mean, that's like an open goal for lawyers. You know, if you say, if there's a special circumstance and you don't give any guidelines what one is, then you can argue anything is. Anyway, Germany picked up on that, special circumstances, and went to the International Court of Justice and said, we want a new map, and the ICJ agreed. And actually, that's now what the delimitation of the North Sea continental shelf looks like. But I want to go a little further into how the International Court of Justice justified going from that map on the left to the map on the right. And in particular, draw out this one fragment of a sentence from the ICJ decision, which I want to analyze in a few pieces. Um, first of all, step one, in this, this fragment from the ICJ decision, they write um, that the shelf constitutes a natural prolongation of its land the state's land territory into and under the sea. Okay, this is a big change from how the shelf was defined before. It's no longer just the usable seabed near the state. It's now a physical, natural prolongation of land, which is crucial because land is so key to how we think of what the state is. Now a certain geophysical connection is being made between the seabed and the state. And this is then taken further um, in, in this next part because what we see is that this whole, the whole idea of territory is then extended to the shelf. Uh, geological links between the seabed and land are then used to extend the idea of state territory from land to seabed. Uh, since land as territory is essential to the state idea, they then say in this section that as much as possible, each state should get its own seabed because it's an extension of that territory that's the very essence of the state. So suddenly now the ocean is being brought into the land in a political way. They're being integrated in a way that they were not before. Uh, from there, everything else kind of follows. Of course, another key pr principle of sovereignty is not just the state controls its land, but the state doesn't interfere with the land of other states. Basic principle of sovereignty, non-exclusive um, exclusion, etc. So this comes out here too that when you're doing delimitation, uh, now that the continental sh continental shelf has been defined as an extension of state territory, these protections that accrue to the sovereign state, including freedom of interference, freedom from interference by other states, can be applied to it, and hence we get to this principle of non-encroachment, which is very different than the conventions uh, than the conventions appeal to mathematically determined uh, equidistance lines. So suddenly now this, this, the seabed kind of joins the state in this almost metaphysical linkage of geophysics to geopolitics that we're all used to seeing on land, but not so used to seeing at sea. Uh, moving on from there, now that the seabed has been kind of brought into the state and the state idea and the idea of politics other social goals can be ascribed in a way that we're accustomed to dealing with states, including that of equity. Um, so this actually, the equity clause in a way replaces that vague appeal to special circumstances that was in the convention. And finally, in another part of the ICJ decision, we learn how to operationalize equity through proportionality. So the idea that there's a, a um, proportional difference between coastlines gets mirrored in the uh, ratio of area of continental shelf. And ultimately, once you've done all that, then it's quite easy to get from that map on the left to the map on right. So having established grounds for adjusting delimitations based on proportionality and non-encroachment, the ICJ then proceeded to redraw the map. So what do we learn from this? Uh, one thing is that the social construction of the ocean, which I wrote a book on, so I know something about, but um, something I hadn't really thought of is how the social construction is actually made possible by a physical construction of the ocean. But at the same time, um, and I don't think this is the only case where, where this has happened. I, actually, I think Schmidt's argument is very much similar. He's arguing for the, a certain physical construction of the ocean to underpin his socio-political ideas. That's what his nothing but waves quote does. Um, 
But at the same time, this physical construction of the ocean is an abstraction that extends terrestrial ideas of land and territory that are themselves based on geophysical abstractions of definite borders, of stable land, of clear divisions between land and water, et cetera. So yes, it extends a state idea to the sea, but in a very abstracted, ossified way, one might even say a little like the painted ship, except now it's a painted ship of state upon a painted ocean. So I want to now move to a second example that takes things a bit further, because while the North Sea delimitation demonstrates how the social construction of the ocean as a space of politics relies on the application of an abstract physicality, in other instances, we see how this is quickly complicated by the fact that this physicality is itself dynamic and unpredictable. That is, when it becomes apparent that there's a lot more to the ocean than just waves, the social construction itself becomes contested. And so here I want to turn to work that I've been conducting with Berit Christofferson on the definition of the marginal ice zone in Norway's Barents Sea. Uh, now a bit of background here. In 2006, the uh, Norwegian state uh, put, uh, issued a marine spatial management plan for the Barents Sea and Lofoten Islands. There's a lot to the plan. It's been updated several times. But the key thing is that the plan uh, prohibits exploratory drilling for oil and gas in the marginal ice zone, the part of the ocean that part of the year is covered by sea ice and part of the year is covered by open water. In practice, that means identifying the southern border of the marginal ice zone. Because of course, what happens is you know, oil drilling happens until you reach that point. And so identifying the ice edge, as it's called, or iskanten in Norwegian, is the kind of key, key delimiter. So identifying the ice edge isn't that hard when sea ice looks like this, but very often sea ice looks more like that. You know, how do you, define, how do you draw an edge through a space like this? So that's part of the problem. How icy does water have to be to be called ice? Um, there's lots of technical remote sensing issues involved in that. Uh, I actually had a PhD student write a whole dissertation on that. Um, but there's also issues of movement of migration. Obviously, you have monthly, you know, over the course of a year, the ice edge moves north and south. There's very short-term migration. You can go from that picture to that picture within a couple of hours. Uh, of course, there's also long-term migration due to climate change, and then there's all sorts of data aggregation issues as well. Uh, but this all became a really hot topic in Norway in 2015, when the Norwegian state announced that they were moving the ice edge. And when the Barents Sea Management Plan was uh, first passed, it was where the green line is, and then in 2015, the government announced we're moving it north to where the blue line is. Basically what they said, okay, we're using the same standards, which is 15% iciness defines ice, which is a pretty standard definition. And um, our definition of where the ice edge is, is where there's a 30% chance that ice will occur in April. April being, of course, when it's furthest south. And we're going to use a data set of many years to, to gather that 30% figure. What they were doing in 2015 is they said, now we can suddenly use a 30-year data set because we have 30 years of satellite data, and 30 years is kind of the norm in climatological research, and we can update it. So we'll move from 1967 to 1989 to 1984 to 2013 and move the ice edge northward based on the new data. All sounds like perfectly good science, except that Norwegian environmentalists noted that on the exact same day when the government announced the new ice edge, they also opened up a new round of petroleum leases, including some areas that are right in that triangle that now suddenly is open for business because the ice edge had moved. And I don't think Prime Minister Anna Solbert really assisted her uh, position when she noted, actually, we are not moving the ice edge. It is actually nature that is currently moving the ice edge, an interesting theme for a uh, all your nature society scholars out there. Um, but this all gets really interesting when you look at the positions taken by numerous parties in the dispute. So the Ministry of Climate and Environment, which basically is the government's position articulated by the prime minister, I mean, these folks are planners. They're trying to create predictable lines in the ocean that can be used for determining what activities can take place where. 
And so they came up with this 30% in April figure, adjusted it based on new data northwards. Actually, then in 2020, as the, the debates continued, they said, okay, you know, we're going to go down from 30% to 15%. And that then moved it back south, kind of close to where it was before it moved north in 2015, but not the exact same place. Meanwhile, environmentalists and actually the Norwegian Polar Institute, which confusingly is within the Ministry of Environment, but has a lot of scientific independence. They said, well, why are we doing this in the first place? Why is there this provision on drilling in the marginal ice zone? It's because it's an incredibly precarious environment. It's key for primary production of phytoplankton and algae that then are the basis of the food chain for the Norwegian cod economy, which is hugely important culturally and economically, as well as, of course, broadly for the ecosystem. And so therefore, we should manage the, uh, the sea or the, the ice edge uh, according to precautionary principle. You know, if there's any chance that ice might occur, since ice is seen as dangerous or that's seen as a precarious environment, we should prohibit drilling. And so the uh, Norwegian Polar Institute actually in 2015 said, and of course the ice edge moves a lot. So let's say for each month, the furthest south that ice has ever been known to occur in the past 30 years, that should be the area north of which no drilling is occurred. Um, nobody liked the idea of adjusting the ice edge every month. It might have scientifically made sense, but from a planning perspective, it was not good. So then when the debate reopened in 2020, they said, okay, let's just do the April line, but where there's a 0.5% likelihood of ice occurring, as opposed to the climate ministry's original 30% and then brought down to 15. Um, so this basically allows for one or two outliers for a really surprisingly cold year, but basically sets it where there's any chance of ice occurring. Meantime, the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy and their aligned oil industry said, you know, what this is really is about is risk. This is about risk. We can measure risk. It's about balancing risk into, and resources. And we have an interest in limiting our liability. You know, we're not stupid. We don't want to create oil spills. Um, but we can measure that. So let's just say we don't drill for ice. We don't drill for ice. We don't drill for oil or ice. Um, any place where ice exists. That's simple enough. So let's invest in remote sensing capabilities to see where and when ice will be forming. Let's invest in technology for quickly dislodging rigs when an ice um, flow is, is about to hit it. And so we'll set a 50 kilometer buffer around. Um, and obviously this is, doesn't lead to a line because it leads to continual interpretation. But in 2020, when this debate was occurring, that led to the line uh, about where the green line is. So what's interesting here though, is that all the parties are working with an understanding of the ocean as unpredictable which actually is quite a bit more sophisticated, I would say, than that pure abstraction of the North Sea decision. But they're mediating that unpredictability and using it to draw lines and make policies in different ways, depending on their perspectives on risk. So the key lesson here is that conflicts over lines in the ocean are not just about where to draw lines, but they reflect different understandings of the ocean as a dynamic geophysical space as a space of risk and opportunity, as a space of predictability and variability, as a space of management and chaos. In short, how and where we draw lines in the ocean reflect and produce meanings that we apply throughout the world as we seek to socially construct space. And again, I think this understanding helps us to understand the power of those four myths with which I began this talk. So I think I've shown how in the North Sea and Norwegian cases, the controversies and strategies mobilized in drawing lines in the sea reflect not just the politics of land, but also many of the key concepts that are engaging terrestrial geographers. Issues of complexity, dynamism, abstraction, representation, and the problems and possibilities that accrue when attempts to make sense of a dynamic and relational physical world are used to bring order to systems of politics and law that require determinate boundaries. In our Wet Ontologies articles, Kim Peters and I have argued that the ocean, where these physical properties are particularly observable, can serve as fruitful foundation for rethinking a world of points, lines, boundaries, and laws. And yet, as we've increasingly argued, that's not enough. 
because the designation of the ocean as a space, as an object with an essence itself restricts our thinking. All too often, it leads to cliched understandings of mobility and flow. At the Osaka conference, I discussed the confounding example of the ice island, T3, a liminal space that is not quite ocean, not quite land, not quite vessel, not quite civilization, not quite sovereign, not quite a space of militarization, not quite a space of science, and actually not quite an island. And I discussed how its ongoing processes of transformation as it moved through space, drifting across the Arctic Ocean, and also moving through time, slowly melting away, how those suggest that the line between a lawless island and being an island of law is thin indeed. And here I want to take this point further, arguing, as Kim and I do in our Ocean in Excess article, that if we want to both critique and work with the idea of the ocean as painted, a space of inscription, abstraction, and rematerialization, if we want to do that, we need to paint outside the lines, focusing not just on the lines that divide the ocean from land or the ones that divide the ocean into zones, but also the lines that cut across sea and land and that bring the ocean into our lives. So consider this image. Now, this is certainly not Schmidt's empty blue ocean, uninscribed and uninscribable, but tellingly neither is it a romantic ocean of gushing turbulence, nor is it an ocean filled with surfers or migrants or container ships or the meanings ascribed by these seagoing humans or their vessels. We don't see shallow waters teeming with an ecosystem partially visible to the human eye, nor a benthos with strange, mysterious creatures. Rather, here we have a tidal flat, a coastline. This is actually Frobisher Bay in northern Canada. Um, temporally dynamic. In fact, it's not even always really there. A space that's difficult to focus on. It's destabilizing and destabilized. And I want to use this image to draw your attention to two themes that I hope make us rethink what it means to paint or paint with the ocean, to draw lines on a canvas and to draw lines on a map and to draw lines through actual encountered space. Now, the first point that I want to pull from the image is the ocean's indeterminacy. In both the North Sea and Norwegian cases, there was no question about where the ocean began. In fact, that article from the Convention on the Continental Shelf that I quoted began with a reference to coastal baselines, the ocean's legal starting point. Looking at this image, though, it's not so clear where the ocean begins and where it ends. In the most literal sense, as open salt water, the ocean is present in only a small part of the image. And these red lines actually mark where the ocean would begin and end under UNCLOS as well. And yet, I would say that every pixel in this image is, in a very material way, oceanic. And in that sense, this image should stand as a metaphor for how the ocean seeps into everything, not just through the hydrological cycle and through the goods transported across its surface, but through the way that it insinuates itself into how we think about difference, distance, temporalities, volumes. And secondly, and relatedly, I want you to focus on how this image of an oceanic space draws your attention to lines and divisions, Divisions that are simultaneously distinct and blurred. Because on the one hand, this photograph depicts some sharply defined geographic divisions between sky, sea, tidal flat, and beach. Material divisions between open water, tidal pool, mud, kelp, land. Conceptual divisions between spaces teeming with life and those that are seemingly inert. Nature society divisions between objects left by tumultuous waves and those deposited by humans. Each of these sets of divisions and lines appears at first glance to be distinct, obvious. The lines are exceptionally sharp. One can see in this image a series of zones delimited as reflections of oceanic and, in some cases, human forces. Returning to Schmidt, on the waves there may indeed be nothing but waves, but each wave, as we see here, transmits a universe of meanings in a manner that is highly differentiated and differentiating geographically. Inscription, in fact, is everywhere. But then the definitions become shakier, dynamic, unstable. Perspective disappears. The image is one big blur of space and light, even as individual features are quite clearly delimited. The image, like the ocean itself, is ultimately a difficult thing to look at because you never quite know where to focus your gaze. As when you view that blue expanse of open water from above in an airplane, uh, focus is hindered by an ability to distinguish foreground from background perhaps because no such distinction actually exists. 
This is a different sort of space where one must learn to see differently, perhaps less with one's eyes than with the haptic approach of a composer or a painter. In showing this image, then, my aim is twofold. On the one hand, to get us to think about the ocean as a complicated, indeterminate space of lines that are drawn and crossed, communicated and obscured, and thus a provocative space to think with, but also at the same time to suggest that once we think with the ocean, the ocean and its zones stop being discrete things at all. Rather, they emerge as a locus for a set of processes and forces that are intertwined with the world at large. And this is a point that Kim Peters and I illustrate further in our Ocean in Excess article by means of an example from Perrinporth on the coast of Cornwall in Southwest England, when in 1997, local residents began to find pieces of Lego on their beaches. More Lego appear appeared than could be explained by a child leaving behind a toy after a family day out. Many of the pieces were ironically of a certain theme, consisting of divers, flippers, octopuses, rigging nets, scuba equipment, and so on. The Lego happened to be the load of the Tokyo Express, a ship that shed 61 containers when caught in a storm off land's end. Light enough to float, the Lego pieces began to travel with the movement of the ocean. Indeed, Lego washed up not only at Perrinporth, but around the world. Now, it's not enough to say that the Lego were transported by the ocean, tracing plastic lines through ocean space, like those lines on the North Sea and Norwegian maps. Rather, the Lego became part of the ocean, bringing the ocean to land, not just through the ways that the specific plastic shapes represented maritime infrastructure and biota, but also through the ways in which it left inscriptions of the ocean's force reproducing traces of liquid ocean once there, but now gone. As is usually the case with flotsam, the Lego and Perrinporth appeared in heaped collections and in lines, reflecting the ocean's ebb and flow on the shoreline, just as we observed previously from Frobisher Bay. The linear patterns along the shoreline link the views of land-based of land beach walkers with the waters beyond the horizon and with ocean events that had occurred years earlier. The ocean remained ashore, even in its retreat, connecting coastal dwellers' views of the sea with childhood stories told of swashbuckling pirates, TV specials about plastic pollution, and once they had brought the Lego home, it connected them with their memories of that day in 1997 when, walking along the beach, they smelled the ocean air and stumbled upon stray Lego pieces. So through the lines that brought the Lego to the beach, the lines the Lego inscribed on the beach and the lines drawn from the beach to homes by residents picking up the stranded toys, the ocean became within the residents of Perrinporth, even as it exceeded its liquid boundaries. So to conclude, I've told here a story of maritime lines from the tidal flats of Frobisher Bay to the delimitation lines of the North Sea continental shelf, from the lines that opened up Germany's petroleum industry to those that have restricted Norway's concluding with the lines drawn by Lego pieces on the beaches of Cornwall. Of course, these are but a tiny fraction of the lines drawn in, by, and across the ocean. But I hope I've demonstrated not just that line drawing is one of the ways in which we assert power in the sea in a complex process engaging a varied tableau of social and physical forces, but also that lines connect the sea and land drawing patterns that literally and figuratively are both perpendicular to and parallel to the coastline. And so what does it mean to encounter a painted ocean? As with Schmidt's nothing but waves quote, I kind of have a sort of love-hate relationship with that line from Coleridge, because after all, we're constantly painting the ocean and painting with the ocean as we weave the ocean into our social designs and as the ocean's affordances, its biology, its mobility, its repetitions, its cycles, its currents, its forcings, as those challenge our landed understanding of points, boundaries, and territories. At the same time, though, this painted ocean is anything but the still and silent world portrayed by Coleridge. In opposition to Coleridge, I would say that when we paint the ocean, whether through pictures, maps, laws, or stories, there is plenty of both breath and motion. And finally, what of those four myths with which I began this lecture? How can my deep dive into the lines that we paint on, of, and with the sea change the way that we approach the taken-for-granted truths contained in these myths? 
And again, my point is not to reject them. I don't think any of them are so much wrong as they indicate a certain perspective that we've taken from land to sea, sometimes without maybe the um, self-reflection that would, would help to, to unpack them. Rather, my point is that we should consider why we so easily accept the myths as true. How does their power as truths, even especially as critical truths, rest on an ontology derived from a world of surfaces, points, lines, laws, territories, and objects with ontological security in space and time? How does their power rely on a framework derived from land where not only is it possible to envision the ocean as painted, but where it is then assumed that such a painted ocean must necessarily be a stilled ocean? And how can we, as ocean geographers, embrace the ocean in all its complexity, all its relationality, and all its indeterminacy to think the world better? Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for your really interesting presentation. So we can say that the painted ocean is sort of empty. <laughs> sort of, yeah. <laughs> empty in its fullness, yeah. Um, we have still about a quarter of an hour. If somebody had a question or comments, please. Maria? Um, Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Phil, for your beautiful uh, keynote speech. And uh, I think uh, you probably ad oriented, or, or, uh, you probably address us to think about, of course, that space is also a product of ideas, and how our cognitions and uh, our uh, cultural background can influence our making of, 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 of our transformation, making use of space. And this recalls me about, of course, ideas about the Mediterranean Sea along, um, uh, along history and the practices, and still reminds me, for instance, about the idea that my country, Italy, has about the Mediterranean. One example is, for instance, the controversy uh, between Algeria and uh, Italy about the extension of maritime exclusive zone, which happens in a kind of a silent sea, because my country didn't think that uh, Italy could really um, make a sharp line of the water because Mediterranean is uh, so closed and uh, a kind of uh, uh, small uh, space. And so probably it reminds me uh, that some countries can have uh, different ideas, more oriented to really uh, oceanic thoughts compared to other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and now probably the, the, my country uh, needs to go back uh, to comfortable conventional ideas about the limitation zones. In your, uh, in your experience, can you make some difference between uh, uh, um, marine ideas uh, stemming from east, uh, for, stemming from different inner seas? I mean, uh, the, the Baltic, uh, the the Far East Sea or the Mediterranean. Do you think there are some different ideas about uh, ocean thoughts and ocean views? Thank you. Hmm. Um, I mean, there's certainly a, a huge variation in, and I do recognize in doing this, first of all, critique of myself. I mean, obviously, in, in creating a sort of broad brush, uh, here's how we think of the sea, we should think about it better. There's a lot loaded in that we. Okay, so I should begin with that. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the point here was to sort of more throw out, there are some dominant ideas out there, let's think about them. Obviously there are lots of other perspectives and um, I touched on it slightly, but I, you know, it just would have gone in a lot of different directions. But that, that's germane to this whole question of what are the different perspectives on <clears throat> inland seas. And yeah, I mean, I think there are, I'm just starting going back to the islands conference you know, it, it is significant that Italy is primarily not an island nation. Obviously, there are islands that are, are very important in Italy, and I, I would get certain people in this room upset at me if I ignore the fact that Italy has islands. But, um, you know, thinking of, of coming from the Osaka conference, where it was so much about, 
And it was an amazing conference because there were so many people there from island nations or Hawaii, which, you know, an island quasi nation, whatever you want to call it. And I think what, what emerged there was, yeah, I think a very, dis, very different discourse of the, the, near, the near sea in their lives. Um, I'm thinking of one presentation, for instance, about uh, a, a native Hawaiian attempt to sort of reclaim a beach through re reclaiming imagination of the nearby ocean. And, and this was a very, it spoke to very specific cultural connections that were then quickly understood across everyone. Um, and actually one very interesting for me, not ever really having done much work in any work, I shouldn't say, in, in Pacific Islands and mostly working in the Arctic, was how we were able to immediately talk about the same stuff, about sort of indigenous peoples using land and water in certain ways, and obviously different things come in when it's frozen a whole lot of the time, which it doesn't tend to be in the South Pacific. But, um, but there was a, real, a really fascinating commonality there. Would that apply in a Mediterranean, or at least I shouldn't say Mediterranean, but an Italian Mediterranean context? I'm guessing somewhat not, because probably the, and I'm not the person to speak to this, but I would guess that the, the ocean as a engaged space, as opposed to one to gaze at and, and fish from, you know, has, has probably a different, different meaning. And then that probably does come out in, in uh, even management strategies for completely different things like oil drilling or migration management or um, attitudes toward neighbors on the other side. Obviously there's a lot also, also that goes on there of colonial histories and, and presence as well. Thank you. Uh, some other, yes, sir. Uh, we, we do. There's this one here, and then Toby, please. Uh, Someone from the chair. Qualcuno che può portare il. No, uh, Stefano, qualcuno che può portare il. Thank okay. You very much, Philip. Thank you for um, your work and that wonderful talk and um, the work at Wet Ontology. So I, I love that. And um, I was, I'm an ocean sailor and I work a lot with itinerant communities. I was wondering how um, or whether it featured um, in your look into ocean ontologies, um, the kind of concept of the blue anarchy and um, navigational practices of itinerant cultures as they inscribe the sea through um, through operationalizing you know this this ontology mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that um, yeah so the, the question I think I heard you right it sort of fuzzed out but um, about uh, navigational systems that are, are I'll, I'll read into it about sort of the mobility of, of space the mobility and, and tra traditions of navigation yeah traditions of navigation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, this, this, the ontology that is both in sort of classic Western, which itself is a generalization, but whatever, classic Western views of the ocean and part of what I was saying, I think even creeps into a lot of critical perspectives on the ocean uh, by people urging ocean sustainability or, or the like, um, still is based on this abstraction and that abstraction comes from, some of it comes from a, a kind of scientific norms, but some of it does come from how we've learned to navigate. You know, the idea that we navigate by a, a grid of unmoving space. You know, when you think about it, it's actually kind of odd as a way to move across the sea. Uh, the same thing's true in oceanography. I don't know if there are any oceanographers here, but I've, I've been told and I should write about this in the wet ontology piece, that in sort of standard practices of oceanography, the first thing you're taught is the ocean doesn't move because that's the, the starting point for the model. And then you, you, once you've imagined this unmoving surface, 
you can then start modeling forces that move across it. But to basically simplify the mathematics, uh, you begin with a non-moving stable background surface, which again is this idealized separation of background and foreground, an idealized separation of space from the actions that occur across it, an idealized separation of place from space even. All these things that we as geographers are like constantly saying we need to get beyond. And then we sort of slip back into it very often when we think about the ocean. And uh, that means looking elsewhere. And it can mean looking at you know, chaos theory inspired oceanography. Um, or it can mean looking at you know, Micronesian navigational practices. It can lead to um, looking at different ways of, of doing science and understanding science. So there is a, you know, there, there's, there's a critique of, there's both a sort of ethnographic, you know, we, we need to open up our practices and, and look broader, but also think about what we accept as, that's why I put in that one myth of knowledge in there, because actually that is, that's part of it, is thinking about what we know, how we know, and why we think we know it, and why we don't actually question that maybe that's only one knowledge. And um, so this, that's again where I think thinking with the ocean is so powerful, because it's a space that we engage so much, it's so important in our world, notwithstanding the fact that it's only 10%, not 90%, but it's still really important. Uh, and yet, and of course it's important for all sorts of climatological processes and things I didn't even get into, um, but at the same time, it, it's so, it, it, it doesn't fit easily within the boxes that we've made for understanding the world. And maybe instead of trying to squeeze it into those boxes, we can actually look at how it opens them up. And I guess that's a little bit of what I was trying to do in this talk. Okay. Uh, so now, <clears throat> please, Tove. Hi. hi, hi, hi. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm Tovi Fenster from Tel Aviv University. And thank you very much. I think it was great, really. I really enjoyed your critique about all these communal assumptions. And what I liked in your presentation is how you travel between geographical scales. But what I missed in your um, talk, and I heard about it only when you answered Maria, is about the human, the, the, the people. Um, for me, it's important because only recently I started working on this field and tomorrow I'm going to present my own little research about how people in the Mediterranean, in Tel Aviv, how do they um, put the borders between the sea and the city? And I show that it is by their clothing and especially the difference between men and women. So I wonder if you can elaborate on this issue. Did you talk, you mentioned the indigenous people in the Arctic uh -huh. and the common language, which is, I think, exciting. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, obviously people are, well, we could argue non-humans as well, but we'll leave, we'll leave that out and just focus on people um, are, are crucial. And I actually tried to bring them in through the Lego story because that's ultimately about the, the connection that people draw to the sea. Obviously, it's in a very indirect way that, you know, but, but I find it interesting because it's in two ways. It's remembering, it's when you actually look at the Lego piece. Well, it connects you to sea voyages. It connects you to, and makes you think about the tumultuous ocean and, and the spill of the containers. It, of course, the image itself of the octopus or whatever makes you think of the ocean. But then, as I say, you actually, it makes you reproduce your encounter with the ocean from when you found that. So it becomes almost a, a Mobius strip of, of reliving a connection with the sea. And I, I think in some ways, maybe in a less dramatic fashion, or maybe more, more lived fashion or something, um, peoples who live by the coast or who venture to the coast, and of course venture out to water, have those sorts of interactions um, and have different ways of understanding their connections to the sea. Um, I'll, I'll give an example from my own life. Uh, I now live about a one minute walk or so from the seafront in New England, which is wonderful. And a uh, very large tidal, tidal expanse. They're not quite as large as Frobisher Bay, but still uh, quite large. And I've become so attuned to the tide 
in a way that I never, I mean, I, you know, I study this stuff, I know it exists, but, and, and I even know that of course it has impacts on how users, you know, it, interact with the coastal zone. But somehow until it became something in my everyday life, I, it, I got a new sense of almost an irrational, like liking the ocean more at low tide. <laughs> because there's, then there are those rocks, and I know those rocks you can go out on. And, you know, it's, it's obviously a very minor kind of connection. I, I don't actually, I'm not seafaring in any sense or seagoing, and to be honest, the water's really cold. I don't even go into it very much. But it still has become a, a part of my life in a way that, you know, I never would have imagined even living a couple kilometers from the coast. And... You know, I, 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 I mean, I just bring that up. I, it's, it's not your work, nor is it the work of a lot of people. But I think that speaks to, yeah, we need to look at the connections that we have for so many reasons, partly for ocean literacy and to understand what's, what's happening, but also to understand how people can bring the ocean into their places, maybe ultimately not just to understand the ocean, but to actually think more critically about the lines that they draw on land. Uh, the lines that are drawn between peoples, between places. Um, you know, I can imagine, uh, you know, for instance, uh, even like, you know, urban zoning politics could actually be informed by thinking about the ways in which we do and don't draw zones in the ocean for the like. And I, I think that would be really interesting to, to work on that front. Okay, uh, one last question. I think that everybody would like to continue to speak with Phil, but we can do it after on the coffee break. Please, uh, Enrico, uh, this is the last one. Um, thank you, Phil, for this amazing um, for this amazing presentation. As you know, I'm a very big fan, <laughs> and thank you also for those four meets. I think that we all have to change our presentation for tomorrow because uh, I personally have the 70% uh, in my presentation also of the session. Um, I think maybe uh, the point can be that the sea is telling us that we need to, to, to think differently, you know? And it was very suggesting, in my opinion, the, the, Lego, uh, the Lego slide that you show us. Uh, because actually, I think this is very meaningful because these things coming back from the sea, they are actually saying two things. So first of all, the, the, the sea gives everything us back, the things, you no? Know? Also co-composed through the materiality of the sea that we have. So with some inscription, actually, and so it's not empty, or maybe, yes, yeah, sort of empty, but we have things and processes of co-composition going on uh, on the sea. Um, I also think that maybe the point is to think with the sea, as you said. Uh, I was wondering, the point is how to engage with the sea, that maybe the point is to completely change the direction, the gaze that we have. So... For example, how it works, are you working with uh, references or community, for example, in, in Norway, so thinking about the eyes and mapping eyes differently, so from a decolonial point of view, for example, or a feminist point of view. Um, so also with way of thinking alternative to the world that we have starting from the sea. I don't know if it's clear, but the point is about totally, completely reference outside the, the, the flat line, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I basically, I agree. <laughs> I think it's the main comment back to that. But how, of course, how do we do it is, is still an open question. And, you know, maybe one reason why this presentation covered a lot of things from a lot of areas, but still left out a huge amount, is because it's more about opening doors to ways of thinking than, than prescribing. I don't know what a single oceanic way of thinking actually would be. I think once you do that, then you start probably giving too much weight to ideas of depth or darkness or flows, and, and those can all become then um, archetypes for, for constructing singular truths. So I think it's more maybe part of an oceanic way of thinking is almost a, a humility and an acknowledgement that there are things you don't know and can't know, and at least can't pin down in a certain space and time. Uh, and so in that sense, it's not so much the literal flow, but the flow that makes, and the mobility that makes knowledge difficult. And then we, um, and then we spin our own sea stories and see where they end up. So I'm, I'm not sure there's a kind of a determinate, I, I don't, 
I don't know if I could ever write a, a cookbook on you know, how to think oceanically, um, but I, I think I can throw out provocations, which is what I'm trying to do. Okay, thank you very much for, again for your presentation. Just some very brief uh, logistical informations. Uh, first, the coffee break will be on the ground floor, so upstairs. Uh, all coffee break that will, will be there. And the Yafo, who wasn't here yesterday, uh, near the exhibition we organize in case of this conference. So for any information on the exhibition, you can ask the staff. But it's a lot of work we've been doing on ocean and marine themes in the university. Um, second, uh, the lunch is free for everybody. There are a lot of places here around, but also here on this underground floor nearby, there is the um, coffee hall of the university, the Mingsa of the university. So if you want to go there or you can go outside, there are many places. Um, the uh, section uh, will be on the ground floor and on the first floor, all session more or less, and some of them are now uh, in bit in delay, so please control on the program. Uh, I see here uh, section 10, 1, 3, 1, 4 and 15, but please control on your program to see exactly when your session will begin. So now we can go all together to the ground floor where there will be a coffee break for everyone.